My next guest has been in exile since last year. He's the former Russian Deputy Energy Minister Vladimir Milov, and he is a vocal critic of President Putin. Joining me now from Lithuania. Vladimir Milov, welcome to the program. When, you know, you see and you can hear these reports of these prisoner exchanges and also know that so many Russians are fleeing Putin's war. What do you make of the fact that, that Russians are doing that? And do you think it'll affect the course of the war or Putin at all? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me here. And obviously, I have to begin with saying that uh, most great majority of the Russian people have never expected any of this, that my country will be involved in such a horrific, genocidal, barbaric aggression against Ukraine. There are dozens of millions of people who are against it, and believe me, they will speak up. Yes, uh, some are fleeing, uh, and many of those people who are fleeing are afraid of being mobilized and sent to fight against their will to the battle lines. But there are many more who are forced to stay uh, because they have nowhere to go. Many just don't have international passports to begin with. And uh, I just wanted to stress how difficult it is, what horrible conditions they are facing inside this totalitarian regime, which is uh, threatening them with real prison terms just for speaking out against the war. Uh, Vladimir Milov, we said that you left, uh, I think, around 19... 2021. Why did you leave? Explain the circumstances of what took you from being a deputy energy minister, i.e. in the inner circle, to an opponent and a critic and somebody who's, who's now willing to live in exile. Well, I left the government 20 years ago and he has been in vocal opposition since then. I used to work with late Boris Nemtsov, with uh, Alexei Navalny. As a matter of fact, I voted against Putin at the presidential elections back in 2000, when I was a government official. It was possible at the time. Russia was a relatively free uh, country. So what made me leave? Uh, you know the story when Alexei Navalny returned and uh, uh, people uh, staged a major protest in Moscow. I had about 20 policemen at my doorstep waiting for me to get uh, arrested. So I quickly understood that uh, if I do not flee the country, I will end up in jail, jail just like Alexei Navalny or Ilya Yashin or Vladimir uh, Karamurza, my fellow comrades. I think, and many of us have chosen, and that's the message from Alexei Navalny, that we need to prioritize to continue the positive work. We'll, we'll yet, we served some time in jail, in jail already. We'll yet probably have this opportunity again. But right now, it's important that many prominent oppositioners are staying free and continue working, broadcasting for the Russian audience and spreading the message of freedom, spreading the message of supporting Ukraine and ending this horrific war. So, so on that level, I then want to ask you about uh, TV Rain. It was one of the very, very few independent um, Russian outlets. It was, it was trying to tell the truth. Obviously, after the war, they left. And they set up shop in, in Latvia. And now, now, just recently, over the last few days, their license has been revoked um, by that country. And Ukraine and Latvia have sort of suggested that they're working to further the Russian war propaganda and the war aim. What is going on? Because I've, sp I've spoken, you know, to the people who run TV Rain, and they didn't seem to be wanting to promote any Russian war aims. No, they do not do this at all. Uh, TV Rain is the most important independent uh, media outlet which operates from exile. Its audience in Russia is dozen mil uh, dozens of millions of people. And it uh, continuously spreads anti-Putin, anti-war messages, exactly what we need right now. Listen, I would just refer to a very recently issued uh, statement by European Federation of Journalists which called Latvia to immediately revoke the decision on suspending TV Rain's license and called it disproportionate and uh, uh, did not really considering the, the uh, context of what was going on and counterproductive. I can explain. It's very simple. In Latvia, uh, there are uh, perpetual tensions between a Latvian population and very significant local Russian population, part of which unfortunately happened to be pro-Putin. That, uh, you know, perpetual conflict sparks onto any Russians which are arriving 
and maybe a couple of times, you know, saying some uh, unfortunate things, doing some slip of the tongue and so on. So I think clearly Latvian response was disproportionate and uh, I would stick to the position of the European mm -hmm. Federation of Journalists and many other prominent speakers who say that uh, TV range should be allowed to continue to operate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've, we've spoken in the past to, to many of the Baltic leaders, and there is a fear of a so-called fifth column. They, they talk about a threat to national security, so does Ukraine. Um, some people have said, you know, sort of, you know, Russian security, maybe FSB people are infiltrating defectors, trying to come and make trouble in these places, as you say, which have sizable Russian-speaking and Russian-leaning uh, minorities. This is what the Estonian uh, prime minister told CNN a few months ago. Our um, Russian population is not the homogeneous group, and, and they have different worries. Of course, uh, in the eastern part of Estonia, there are also people who are uh, more in the propaganda sphere of, of Russia, uh, so, so that they are hearing uh, these narratives that Russia is presenting. But uh, we are working on keeping our society together. While we have different views of our past, we have a common future with those people. So I, I heard what you said about, you know, about them and they should take the European, you know, report about this. Do you not think, though, that, that shutting down something like TV Rain actually helps Russia rather than hurts it? This is exactly right. It is a legitimate security concern about many Russians coming in and some of them probably spreading uh, messages that help Putin. But listen, I think shutting the door and cancelling and uh, refusing all Russians, including dozens of millions of pro-democracy Russians who are opposed to Putin, that's a wrong thing to do. Exactly. This is helping Putin more than doing him uh, harm. This demoralizes a lot of people who look at Europe as the beacon of hope in uh, this uh, age of darkness. Uh, it also, I mean, uh, Putin's spokesman, all of the Kremlin propaganda, they were ecstatically happy about Latvia shutting down uh, TV rain. They say, listen, we told you, it's not a real democracy, it's the same kinds of censorship lawless censorship that we have here in Russia. Mm -hmm. So that's a very counterproductive move. I just hope that Latvia reconsiders. Well, to that point, I just want to emphasize what you just said, because Putin's own spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, said yesterday, it always seemed to some people that somewhere is better than home, that there's freedom somewhere, but at home there's no freedom. This is one of the clearest examples that demonstrates the falsity of such illusions. So it is interesting that these, you know, these, these decisions can have that kind of backlash reaction. But I want to ask you to turn your, your attention to the, to the sanctions, et cetera. Um, you know, Putin has said a lot about how actually his economy is fine, that, you know, yes, they have to be a bit, you know, more careful and vigilant, but they're reaping the benefits of the skyrocketing oil prices and a lot. But others suggest that the sanctions are hurting and will continue to hurt even more. Can you tell me from your perspective as a former minister and what you're seeing there, how you think it's affecting them? Uh, as a matter of fact, to put it shortly, sanctions are having devastating impact across the board, across all sectors, supply side, demand contraction, investment, like everywhere. And uh, Putin's been only able uh, to sort of stay afloat PR-wise because He's been concealing a lot of statistics, a huge pile of statistics since the beginning of the war. On top of that, you have a very narrow number of Potemkin indicators, which are manipulated GDP, unemployment, or uh, ruble exchange rate. As a matter of fact, central bank had shut down completely uh, free convertibility of ruble, something unseen in more than three uh, decades. If you look like unemployment, uh, on paper, it's the lowest on record. But there are about 5 million people, according to official statistics, who are under hidden forms of unemployment, unpaid leave, downtime, partial work, working week, and so on. You see, across different indicators, you see major economic contraction, which is significantly higher than uh, the official numbers that are stated by the Russian propaganda. 